Hello. Okay, we're now going into lecture two. You should be having your notes ready for chapters four and five. We're going to be facing the dynamics of microbial growth and control of microbial growth. Now, when we talk about this for the most part, we're going to be talking about prokaryotes. A couple of things to keep in mind. Um, one, again, review the glimpse of history that's on page 92, as well as the key terms. Now, when we talk about the analysis and cultivation of the growth of prokaryotes, it can be very challenging because there's a variety of factors that have to be considered. Uh, that's why in some cases the total number of microbes that exist out there are just stunning. We've only been able to effectively and sometimes with difficulty culture or obtain a pure culture of 1% of all of those. Think of that on the whole planet. Different prokaryotes have different requirements for nutrients, exposure to select gases, waste removal, temperature, light, uh, other factors. Some are difficult because you can't culture them alone. They have to grow as they grow in nature, basically in mixed uh, microbial communities. And you can see here we've got little colonies spread out on what would be presumably a agar culture. This is also an image that you start off in your chapter and what they've done is they've added a dye, eosinmethylene blue, to make it much more clearer to see. And this is E. coli. Now Techniques for measurement of growth can include direct methods, counting the cells, one, two, three, four, five, six, or indirect, based on their chemical activity methods. And we're going to talk about that. Also, growth rates depend on the time course for the binary fission. Just to get you started, all right, a, an E. coli cell will divide by binary fission once, dingo, every 20 minutes. Okay, microbial growth is really an increase in the number of cells in a population. So, my binary fission is really neat because it's a method of asexual reproduction in which one cell divides into two. So, if you want to colonize a planet and you only got one cell, you drop it down there, and if everything works out well, great. After a period of time, you're going to have a teeming amount of those cells. And it depends on the doubling time. Doubling time is the time period for the population to double. So, basically, you go from one to two and two to four, and you go on and on and on. Well, as I said, the time varies for different types of bacteria. E. coli takes 20 minutes. And you think about it, that means in one 24-hour period, at one doubling per 20 minutes, starting with one cell, that means you're going to have 72 doublings, which equals n to the 72 minus one total cell with n as the number of original cells. And that's a lot of cells. And I show you the formula in my uh, lecture notes, which I encourage you to know. Different though from mycobacteria tuberculosis, their doubling time is anywhere between 12 and 24 hours. So if you're sitting there going, I want to make a whole colony, a whole mess of cells to study. E. coli, real quick. Set up the culture, next day it's done. Okay. Um, basically, mycobacterium tuberculosis, a lot longer, a lot, lot longer. You can see the math here for the exponential growth, and that's uh, table 4.1. And that's a lot of cells. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> and mind you, if you sit there and say the numbers don't count correspond, they're only going four hours. I say 24 hours, that's basically 72 doublings. Okay. Now we got to deal with issues about microbial growth in nature. Usually you have mixed cell systems. You have microbial ecology as a study of interactions of various microbes with each other in their environment. Um, you've probably heard the term uh, biome, microbiome, when it talks to the for example, the collection of different bacteria that exist in the gastrointestinal system, or on the skin, okay, or in the 
upper respiratory area. Mixed communities may supply different cells with nutrients and create conditions for other cells to survive. That's why sometimes it's been very hard to separate out one cell from the rest of the community and be able to develop a pure culture because all of these different cells are interdependent on their survival. The other issue comes up with biofilms. And this is an example, in a way, it was found on the inside of an indwelling catheter. Now, any of you that are presently working in a hospital, et cetera, or a nursing home or something, you know what indwelling catheters are. This is not something you'd want to see on it. And, of course, you'd have to need a microscope to see it. But basically, the biofilms will provide a growth environment for the various microbes. And they will, at the same time, as I mentioned before, they'll provide the microbes protection from harsh environments, immune systems, exposure to antibiotics, things like that. Here's an example of planktonic bacteria move to the surface and adhere. And then they start producing this extracellular poly uh, polymeric substance, the EPS. That's the biofilm. That's their protection. And basically from there, you see that they're all still being able to live, multiply, but they're protected. Basically, nutrients can come through and waste products will pass out of the biofilm but antibiotics and other materials, antibodies, no, 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 won't go. If they get mobile and they're freed from the biofilm, then they're much more subjected, uh, much more suspect to various types of influences like antibiotics, antibodies, etc. Now, when we talk about microbial growth in laboratory conditions in the pursuit of pure culture, we have to get some definitions down. A population of organisms for a single species is descended from a single cell. So those single colonies you see there started off, each one a single cell, which divided to two, divided to four, divided to eight, and you see the progress. Due to various growth requirements of many cultures, as I said, only 1% of all species have been successfully cultured as a pure culture. To prevent contamination of the culture, all cultured materials must be sterile, that is, free from microbes. This is where we get into aseptic techniques, which you're going to be dealing with in, um, I'm not sure, I think it's week two in the lab. You need to get familiarized with it. These procedures are required to prevent or minimize the chance of other organisms being accidentally introduced. Usually organisms are cultivated in a medium of nutrients, either in a liquid form or a medium dissolved in a solidified gel-like support. Now, everybody knows, that, or a lot of people know about agar, and I encourage you to review the glimpse of history on page 92 to let you know there are other solid support mediums. As a matter of fact, I did experiments years ago, one called pectin. And pectin sounds familiar for those of you that are jelly makers. There is what they call a low-sugar pectin, which was actually extracted from the, um, basically the rinds of oranges, etc. This pectin with a calcium, um, I believe it's a calcium chloride uh, binder, will form a very nice gel. And it will be a very solid, reliable support medium uh, for bacterial cultures. Problem? It's not accepted because everybody else uses agar. And it can't be immediately accepted for things like, oh, drug studies or uh, various other health products because it's different. The pectin is different from the agar. And so they wouldn't be able to say, well, this is the same thing as you have to develop other studies to show that it has the same effect with agar. Now, when you have a single cell that will multiply in a solid medium, in a limited area to form a colony. And you can see all of these, this, this one, this one, this one, these are colonies. It's a mass of cells descended from original cell. We're going to be talking about using agar, and agar is a polysaccharide extracted from marine seaweed, algae. And it's used to, to solidify a specific nutrient solution. Most bacteria cannot dissolve agar, which is fortunate. 
Um, they tried to use other mediums, but unfortunately they stayed liquid and the bacteria would plunk to the bottom or they wouldn't stay solid. Gelatin is one. And as a matter of fact, there's a diagnostic for it. If it turns out that that bacteria is positive for gelatinase, it basically will break down gelatin. The nice thing though, or the advantages for agar are it's easy to melt, it takes about 95 degrees Celsius, so just a little bit below boiling of water, cools at 45 C, stays solid at 37 C, so you can have it at basically body temperature to do microbial experiments, no problem. Uh, it's usually held on a petri dish, which is that flattened dish, which you see such down here, um, which is a two-part covered container made of glass or plastic. Most places now have a disposable plastics. Glass you don't see as much because usually glass, because it's more expensive, would require it being re-cleaned every time to be reused. They get expensive. An agar plate is basically saying it's a petri dish with an agar medium, such as what you see right there. Now, we deal with concepts called streak plate method. The streak plate method is pretty straightforward. The idea is that you take a loop of a culture, as you can see here. The loop is dipped into this liquid culture, a broth culture, and out of that little loop is going to be a small amount of solution that contains the bacteria. And what you do is you open up the lid of the agar plate and you sweep it back and forth in a certain manner, turn it 90 degrees, sweep it again, turn it 90 degrees, sweep it again, and what you're doing is as you're sweeping back and forth, you're making a thinner and thinner layer of the bacteria in that solution to the point where you basically are streaking out almost single cells. And that is where you're going to basically get your small amount. See here? First part, big and thick. Turn it 90 degrees, streak again. Turn it 90 degrees, streak it again. And notice at the end, you thinned out the amount of bacteria to the point where you can have individual dots, these little colonies, set up by one single bacteria. Each time, of course, you're going to have to sterilize the loop to do this. Sterilization is basically exposing it to the flame really quickly till it heats up. The material is made of what's called nichrome wire, which makes it resistant to rapid melting down because of heat rapid oxidation. But it's an interesting thing I had from one biologist, microbiologist, who told me, you know what, it's not the heat of the flame as much that will kill off anything, it's the free radicals in the plasma of the flame that help sterilize the site, which I thought was interesting. But, now let's say that you've been able to be successful and you've done this to subsequently dilute an inoculum on the surface of an agar plate and you've created single colonies. Now, that allows you to then take that isolated colony, started by one bacteria cell, and set up a stock culture. Now, the culture will be stored for use as an inoculum for later procedures, experiments, research, etc. Sometimes you want to do what's called an agar slant. This is where you take a test tube. No, can't see it there, but let's just take this test tube right here. If this test tube had, instead of a broth medium, had an agar culture, you tip it on the side, and you're increasing the cultivating surface area on the top, and you put the uh, culture in, you can actually take this, slow it down the activity of the bacteria, and make uh, a refrigeration um, and basically you can create sort of, I'll come back to that culture later, six months later, it's in the refrigeration, or it's frozen, and that bacteria will still be there. You'll pull it out, pull out the agar slant, take some of the culture from the agar slant, and move on. Frozen stocks, that's a little bit different. Only in this, the idea that you're going to have to give it sort of an antifreeze so it doesn't form ice crystals inside the bacteria cells to burst the cells. So what you do is you add some glycerol that helps prevent the formation of ice crystals. Now there's another type of process to store these, and that's lyophilization. It's a freeze-drying method. You drop everything down to freezing. You remove the uh, pressure, which causes the water crystals to basically boil off at such a low temperature. Everything is lyophilized, 
basically freeze dried and you add water later and you revive the cells and you're able to move on. Now, let's talk about some growth parameters. And by the way, here's another fine streak area. And as time has gone on, you can see how the larger population of cultures develop after incubation. You can see those individual colonies there that you could isolate from there for the culture. When we talk about growth, we have to keep in mind two different types of systems. A closed or batch system, which is a limited time culture where the nutrients are not renewed, wastes are not removed. If I have a uh, petri dish and I don't change anything, after a while, yes, the cells will grow, they'll use up the nutrients, and after the nutrients are used up, the cells will start dying. They will start getting erratic. Some will basically live off the waste. Some will mutate. Some will do this or that. That's not what you want. But basically, populations in closed systems follow a growth pattern called a growth curve, which I'm showing you now. Is there an alternative? Yes. It's called an open or continuous system. And this is where you have extended time culture where the, cell, the cells are in a state of continuous growth. And this is due to continuous addition of nutrients and removal of waste. Sometimes you can put this into a jar and you put in new nutrients as you pull out old wastes. Sometimes what you do is you just keep transferring the bacteria from one plate to the next. When they have grown over the plate, it's time to take the sample of the culture out, put it in a fresh new plate, new nutrients, no waste, and you continue this process. Now, there is a device called a chemostat. This is used to continuously drop fresh nutrients into the growth chamber while at the same time you're removing an equal volume of cells, spent medium, and waste via an outlet. Okay? The cells will remain at a constant cell density and are in a log phase of growth curve, which will show you this. Basically, they continue to grow because some of them get kicked out because the wastes are removed and there's new food nutrients present. If you take a look at the growth curve, there's five stages. There's the lag phase, that's where the cells tool up for growth and replication. The log phase, the exponential of growth. This is where cells divide at a constant rate. They have no influences of a buildup of waste. They have no influences of a starvation due to loss of nutrients. They just continue to grow and they increase exponentially. A stationary phase occurs, and that's a plateauing. The cells have exhausted their supply of energy and nutrients. The cell numbers are stable. That is, the number of dying is equal to the number of multiplying. The death phase follows, and this is where the total viable cell numbers are declining. Death is beginning to be exponential. In other words, the numbers dying is greater than the numbers multiplying. The phase of prolonged decline may last for quite some time. Why? Because Dying cells will provide nutrients. They'll burst and release materials that can be harvested from some of the fitter cells to reproduce. But that may not reflect really the true nature of the culture that you started with at the lag phase and in the exponential phase. You have to be aware of that. So the cell curve is on a slope of death. Now, there's one other thing that you have to be aware of. Metabolites. Remember we talked about last lecture that there are certain products made by cells that we want. You know, it might be butanol, acetone, uh, vitamin C, citric acid, malic acid. I can go on and on for a week, but I won't. The primary metabolites, these are compounds made by a cell during the log phase. That's maybe what you want. Secondary metabolites, these are compounds made by a cell during the late log and stationary phase. That might be what you want. And therefore, you're going to allow a certain amount of time and a certain amount of the cell growth to occur. And then you're going to favor a particular secondary metabolite over a primary or vice versa. Colony growth, the dynamics vary upon location of individual cell within the colony. Now, the center of the colony is going to be at the death phase. This is dying due to depleted nutrients and the buildup of waste. The edge of the colony is at exponential growth. That's due because they have still the presence of nutrients. And what about the cells in between? They're in the stationary phase. Now, moving forward, I would encourage you to take a look at Table 4.2. We're going to be talking about the environmental factors 
that affect growth. And this comes back to, you know, what, what are the available nutrients, etc. First off, you got to keep in mind that various organisms grow under very specific temperature, nutrients, pH, gas requirements. There may be some other factors involved uh, that are environmental. Now, when you talk about extremophiles, these are organisms that live under the most extreme of temperature, barometric pressure, other environmental conditions. All of these are members of the domain archaea. So they may be under extreme acidity or alkalinity or, or extreme high concentrations of salt. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. When we talk about temperature, there are different terms, and you need to get these down, especially if you're doing the labs this week. You've got to be on top of these terminologies. Optimum growth temperature is a temperature at which the organism multiplies most rapidly. So it's the most favorable time for binary fission and for the life cycle. Okay? Various organisms have optimum growth temperatures and are classified by these aspects. So, psychrophiles, remember philes are sort of like like, I like this, is between minus 5 degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius. Psychrotrophs are between 20 and 30 C. Mesophiles are between 25 and 45 C. Most disease-causing organisms are adapted to growth in 35 to 40 C. Oh, let me help you there to understand it much better. Body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So, mesophiles, those are the ones that are going to sit there and going, oh, it's a warm body. This is a good place to infect. Now, those that live in the soil are usually much closer to 30 degrees Celsius. Thermophiles... Those are the ones that enjoy and really flourish in 45 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. Now, if you're not familiar with 70 degrees Celsius, you're talking that's up in the 150, 160 range, 170 range. That's hot. That's where you're going to find it in hot springs and water heaters and compost heaps. Okay? Hyperthermophiles, these are the ones that may include some of the extremophiles. They live between 70 degrees C and 110 degrees C. They're found in hydrothermal vents. They are sources of heat-stable enzymes, etc. And by the way, 110 degrees Celsius? Now, wait a minute. I thought boiling water was 100 degrees Celsius. Right. But if you have pressure, such as a deep sea, two miles down at hydrothermal vents, water can be 110 or 120 C and still liquid state. Okay, same thing as a pressure cooker. Now, temperature plays a role in food preservation. As psychrophiles and psychrotrophs can thrive in refrigerated foods, freezing will stop growth but not necessarily kill the bacteria. So what you have to be aware of is that if you freeze it, then you've got to do something else. Temperature plays a role in disease as some organisms favor cooler parts of the body. For example, leprosy, the mycobacterium leprae grows in cooler extremes of the body, which accounts for why you start seeing the deterioration, because that's where a lot of bacteria are, in fingers, toes, the tips of the nose, the, uh, the pinnas, the tips of the ears, etc. Treponina pallatum, syphilis, grows in the cooler body parts as well. Let's go to oxygen requirements here. Now, table 4.3, you can show, you can see this clearly. Notice the presence of the, the darkened red spheres, which are the bacteria cells, where they are located, at the top of the tube, middle tube, bottom of the tube, etc. Okay? Oxygen can be essential or toxic, and in some other microbes, such as yeast, that can be true also. Oxygen requirements are a method of classification of organisms. Obligate aerobes. Obligate means absolutely. You're obligated. It's absolute. You need it. Absolute oxygen requirements. They use aerobic respiration. They have enzymes, catalase, and superoxide dismutase. Obligate anaerobes cannot multiply in the presence of any oxygen. They use anaerobic respiration or fermentation. They need, have neither catalase or superoxide dismutase, which would handle uh, if they ended up with radical oxygen um, with, with oxygens or radicals that could cause damage to the cell membrane, etc. Facultative anaerobes. 
faculty of the sort of, yeah, I can get along with it, but, you know, I don't need it, but I can get along with it. They grow better if oxygen is present, but they can grow without it. And they have the capacity for aerobic respiration or fermentation. Uh, they have enzymes, catalase and superoxide dismutase. Just let me give you a pointer also. Another facultative organism, not bacteria, but one you probably are all common with, yeast. Once the yeast have used up all the wonderful oxygen and the good old sugar, then they go from aerobic fermentation, aerobic respiration to fermentation. And that's when you see the production of alcohol. And they eventually die of, uh, as the alcohol levels build up. micro require a small amount of oxygen, 2 to 10%. Now keep in mind, atmospheric level of oxygen is what? 21%. They, if, if you have higher amounts of oxygen, it's inhibitory. They have small amounts of catalase and superoxide dismutase. Aerotolerant anaerobes are indifferent to oxygen. They have superoxide dismutase. Now keep in mind that the enzymes that prevent oxygen ion and, and hydrogen peroxide, the product of metabolism with oxygen, damage are catalase and superoxide dismutase. Catalase takes hydrogen peroxide and converts it to water and oxygen. Super oxide dismutase takes four oxygen ions and joins it with two hydrogen ions to form one molecule of oxygen, one molecule of hydrogen peroxide. Note, some strict anaerobes have superoxide dismutase. If you take a look on those tubes, where do you see the, the, the dots of bacteria? Obligate aerobe, they're near the top, near to the air. Facultative anaerobe, they're throughout the entire tube. Obligate anaerobe, they're down at the bottom of the tube. Micro aerophile, they're somewhat below the surface. They get lesser amount of oxygen, but enough that they're comfortable. Aerotolerant aerobe, all over the tube. They could care less. Let's talk about pH issues for a minute. Most bacteria live as neutrophiles. In other words, they prefer living in the range somewhere in the pH range of 5 to 8. Acidophiles live in a pH below 5.5. Alkalinophiles live in a pH above 8.5. Now, we've got to go into water next. Really? Yeah. Here's why. Remember, water is essential for growth. The to tonicity of solutes, okay? Remember, solutes, not water, but solutes, is critical for the bacterial survivor. Hypertonic solutions can lead to plasmolysis, the process of water diffusing from the cell, resulting in the cytoplasm dehydrating and shrinking. If you remember that when you had this in ANP1, we talked about this, uh, basically the crenation, how the red blood cell, when it's exposed and has all the water leave of it, the volume decreases and it, the red blood cell crumples up. It looks like a raisin. Now, Prokaryotes can compensate for hypertonic exposure by pumping potassium ions inside of the cell. Osmotolerant, these are bacteria that can tolerate high salt solutions, up to 10% sodium chloride, such as Staphylococcus. Halophiles require high levels of sodium chloride to grow. Okay? Let's start talking about nutritional factors. If you take a look at Table 4.4, all organisms require some basic substances as building blocks for complex molecules, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, etc. Now, don't forget, the building blocks for proteins are what? Amino acids. The building blocks for nucleic acids are what? Nucleotides. The building blocks for um, triglycerides, you're going to have to have fatty acids, and you're going to have glycerol. Okay, and the building blocks for polysaccharides are going to be what? Monosaccharides, simpler sugars. The major elements that are needed in some cases, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and iron. There are some trace elements that are needed in very small amounts. Most of those are for enzyme function, cobalt, zinc, copper, molybdenum, and manganese. Now with heterotrophs, okay, they're telling you where you're going to get their food where they're going to get the carbon. Heterotrophs obtain carbon from other organic compounds. You and I are heterotrophs. I go out and I get myself a bread or steak or anything else. That's where I'm going to get my carbon sources. Autotrophs produce organic carbon, 
compounds on their own using inorganic carbon source like carbon dioxide. Basically what we're talking about is, gee, all plants are autotrophs. They basically would take light energy, take the inorganic carbon dioxide source to bang, put it together to make organic carbon compounds like sugars, etc. Now, growth factors. These are compounds a particular organism cannot synthesize and must be included in the medium to support growth of that organism. When you say something is fastidious, it's very exacting. These are organisms that require many growth factors. In short, what you're going to find is that these organisms require vitamins in the culture medium. They cannot synthesize them themselves, and so they need to find them. These organisms would get their vitamins, their nutrients, from the host interstitial fluid or inside of the cells in the cytoplasm. Okay? This is, again, getting you oriented because we're going to eventually deal with these organisms as pathogens, etc. Phototrophs, organisms that use light energy for metabolic activity. Chemotrophs are organisms that use chemical energy for metabolic activities. Some will actually use hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen gas, or methane. Okay? So these are the terms the ones you get familiarized with. We're going to be moving through this in the next few minutes to get an understanding of where nutritional factors come from and how they are used and where are they going to be used. Nutritional diversity. If you take a look, organisms have different means to obtain carbon and energy, and you've got to keep those separate now. Where do you get the energy to make the carbon where do you get the energy to do the various cell actions? If you're a photoautotroph, that means everything. Your energy source is sunlight. Your carbon source is CO2. If you're a photoheterotroph, you use sunlight, but you get your carbon source from organic compounds. Some of you might be getting confused. Organic compounds. Uh, you have fungi, they will break down, you know, uh, wood, they will break down paper, they will break down an orange rind. That's, they're breaking those organic compounds down to simpler forms. They will take that in as their carbon source. You will have certain plants that will, yes, have their energy source, but they will have to make their own organic compounds and they make it with the energy from sunlight, and they use carbon dioxide. But let's get it a little bit more interesting ones. Chemo, chemo. When you start hearing chemo, start thinking about where the chemicals are coming from. The first word's usually going to teach you, whether it's photo or chemo, the energy source. The latter words will give you a hinting of where the carbon sources are. Heterotroph means from some other carbon source, organic compounds. Chemo means inorganic chemicals. Litho tells you it's usually from stone or from the, the inorganic compounds. So my energy source, inorganic chemicals, hydrogen gas, ammonia, nitrate, iron, hydrogen sulfide. Where am I getting uh, carbon dioxide, my carbon source? It's an autotroph, so it's basically getting it from carbon dioxide, which will be my carbon source. Here's the big one, chemo, organo, Heterotroph. I know it's a mouthful, but listen. Chemoorgano means basically I'm getting my energy source from organic compounds, sugar, amino acids, etc. Where am I getting my organic, my carbon? Heterotroph from other organisms, from other sources of organic compounds. Okay? Hopefully that'll help you there. Now, moving on. We need to deal with characteristics of representative media used to cultivate bacteria. See, what you got to understand is this. When we've been talking about culturing bacteria, they didn't just magically make up overnight culture media. There were people that designed it, did experiments, etc., and they, they had to think for a bit, say, well, what is this thing in its natural environment? Where does it get its carbon? Where does it get its energy? If I've supplied all the basics, what is it, fussy? What is it, fastidious? Maybe we've got to get something else here. Ah, this is where we're going to get into media terms. Okay, ready? Good. And by the way, 4-6, you really should know those types. Flat out, hint, hint. When we talk about a complex media, it's composed of ingredients such as peptones and extracts. So basically, 
clips of uh, uh, small clips of proteins, etc. They're short chains of amino acids or free amino acids, usually pre-digested by enzymes. The extracts supply other essential nutrients. For example, they may include blood agar. Chemically defined, that's composed of precise mixtures of pure chemicals. Okay? And you might, if you want to get a clear understanding of that a little bit more, take a look on table 4.7. So if you go to 4.7, there's a comparison. A nutrient broth would be peptone, meat extract, and water. Basically, lots of little uh, complex medium. But if you're going to do it chemically, you measure out a certain amount of glucose, a certain amount of dipotassium phosphate, a certain amount of monopotassium phosphate, a certain amount of magnesium sulfate, ammonium sulfate, calcium chloride, iron sulfate, water. Yeah. You could get the iron from uh, the meat extract. You could get some of the... Um, other things from some of the other aspects, but no. Chemically defined, it's a precise mixture. Now, the nutrient agar, that's the nutrient broth plus agar. Let me go back one here. Okay? The reason that you're going to include colonies of, uh, you're going to have blood, is because colonies of hemolytic organisms are surrounded by a zone of red blood cells they're clearing out, and that gives you a certain information. So blood agar is agar with red blood cells included. A lot of times you get it from sheep. Okay. Chocolate agar is agar plus lysed red blood cells included, so it gets sort of a chocolatey colored look. Okay. But it's very important in fastidious bacteria. Selective media. This is media in which one additional ingredient has been added to inhibit the growth of other organisms, other than the one being sought. If you take a look at Thayer Martin media, the complex media is used to isolate Nesseria species, but must include antibiotics to inhibit the growth of other organisms. Okay? That's important. Makanki agar contains crystal violet and bile salts. Now, if you think bile salts, think about the intestine. Okay? This is to inhibit gram positive and non intestinal bacteria, selective, therefore, only for intestinal gram-negative bacteria. So you wipe out the gram-positives off the bat, and what you do is you make it favorable only for intestinal gram-negative bacteria. Okay? And if you take a peek at the McConkey stain, there it is. But let's go back one more step or two. Now, differential, when we talk about differential medium, that contains an ingredient that, has, that can be changed by certain bacteria. Think of it this way. The material that gets changed becomes sort of a flag, and that will tell you a certain behavior of that particular organism. Blood agar. Blood agar, if the blood cell is lysing due to the bacteria containing hemolysin, you have alpha hemolysis for streptococcus. They create a green zone of agar. But beta hemolysis, you have the streptococcus pyrogens. That's what you get for strep throat. And they create a clear zone in the agar. Okay? So you've got beta hemolysis on the left, alpha hemolysis on the right, no hemolysis on the top there. And you can see another situation of that over here, okay, you'll get other types that will create a green zone. You can see the green zone on the lower uh, slide there. You've got no reaction here, but you've got alpha hemolysis on the lower one. Okay, let's go to atmospheric conditions. Uh, atmospheric condition, aerobic, normal oxygen content in the air. You put it in the culture, uh, the incubator, and wait a little time. But what happens if you've got to have increased carbon dioxide? This is called caprophiles. You would use a candle jar, uh, which burns a candle to increase the carbon dioxide, reduce the oxygen levels. You can do that. There are some now that have special packets that you put in, seal the jar, and give it a certain time in the incubator to grow. Um, 
Some of these will also allow for growth in environmental chambers, which eliminate any presence of oxygen. And you can see that here, and you can see that here. Each of these are like glove boxes you may have seen. The only difference is that uh, basically on that lower right, you see there looks like a little doorway. That's where new material would be brought in, etc. Go through an airlock, and the entire atmosphere inside of that gloved box is predominantly CO2. Okay? Uh, culture medium. Enrichment culture provides conditions in the broth, the medium, that favors growth of one particular organism in a mixed population. Okay. Now that's that's important. Now some of you um, might have a difficulty here, but let me throw this out to you. Those that want to be nurses, etc. And somebody says, "Well, I need um, I need sputum." Now, without being gross, think about the sputum. If you're going to do a uh, tuberculin test or uh, something else, you've got other types of bacteria you don't want growing in that uh, medium. You want to try to separate out or filter out winnow out the bacteria that you really want from the bacteria that you don't need. And that's part of the entire principle there. Okay? You want to be able to isolate those organisms, and you can see that. So the medium contains nutrients that few species other than the one of interest can use, and then you incubate it, and the species of interest multiplies, whereas the others cannot. And you have an enriched sample that's plated onto the appropriate agar medium. A pure culture is obtained by selecting a single colony of the species of interest. Now we've had all these culture techniques, but how do we know how many cells are there? How can we determine this? Well, there's a bunch of different neat techniques. They're listed on five point, uh, excuse me, four point eight uh, direct viable cell counts, measuring biomass, detecting cell products. Let's just go through them relatively quickly. Direct cell count, you're using counting chambers to count cells in a known volume of liquid. Here's a uh, hemocytometer. Um, it's used very commonly. What you have is a counting chamber, a grid. You put a liquid here that contains the, the cells, and you put a glass plate over it, and you just sit there, and I've done this before myself, and you're just using a counter and clicking off. The amount of liquid that you've put in there is part of the multiplication so that you can say, well, if the square holds X amount of cells for this amount of milliliter, then you know that uh, s there are so many cells per milliliter that can be de deduced from this process. Now, you can also go instead and use an electronic instrument that counts cells as they pass through an electronic aperture. This is a Coulter counter. And what happens is that you take the sample, run it through, and there's an electron detector, electric detector, it may be with a uh, laser beam or some other type. Some of them are very good because you can also add a dye. And if the cells are alive, they kick the dye out. If the cells are dead, they absorb the dye, and that's it. Same thing with the hemocytometer. I would do that sometimes. Basically, in these flow cytometers, you can also stain or fluorescently tag the cells as they pass through the optical aperture. A little head here for a second. Let me just go back. You also have plate counters, and literally what you do is you determine the cell counts via the number of colonies present on a petri dish. It requires the dilution of the cell sample solution. So, think about it this way. If you look at the bottom on the bottom left, you, you take a smear and there's way too many cells and the colonies just bleed over on top of each other. You'd have a very difficult time. So what you do is a serial dilution. And a serial dilution is basically a series of dilutions. Usually you're going to go twofold, tenfold. In other words, uh, if I take one mil from a 10 mil bacterial culture, put it into a 9 mil dilutant, uh, I end up with a 1 to 10 dilution. I just shake that for a minute, take 1 mil from that tube, put it into the next tube of 9 mils, and I've made, instead of a 1 to 10 dilution, I've made a 1 to 100 dilution. And you continue to keep doing this until basically you've got perhaps a 1 to 10,000 dilution. 
then you pour those 10 mils onto the, the uh, plate and see how many colonies you get out of it. And that would give you a mathematical arrangement of how many cells are in the mill. And in this case, instead of pouring the whole tube, they just took one mill uh, sample from each one of the dilutions. And you can determine how many colonies you've got, which means how many cells. Okay? Now, you can do this both um, from a spread plate method which you add your sample and then you just take a glass spreader, of course you've sterilized it first, and lay it out on a solid agar and you just kind of like um, if you take a knife and put it over the uh, frosting on the cake, just smear it over the top and you spread out all that solution. That looks nice and you incubate it and you've got the bacteria colonies appearing only on the surface. That's your spread plate method. The pour plate method is different. Instead, you've made your uh, sample of the culture. And what you're going to do, though, is you're going to inoculate an agar medium with bacteria cells. The inoculum and the melted agar are added to the Petri dish where the agar hardens. So what's going to happen now is you've got cells mixing around both inside of the agar, on the top of the agar, toward the bottom of the agar, and the colonies are going to grow both in the surface and within the medium. So what are the key points to knowing this in calculating colony forming units? The number of colonies formed, the amount of sample that was diluted before it was being plated, and the amount of media plated. That's the point. And if it doesn't make as much sense, next time you hear about the health or safety of a local water body, and they say, yes, it's okay to swim. No, it's not. There's pollution in there. And we came up with a count of 50 colony or, or 50 CFUs. That means colony forming units. It means there's a lot of bacteria in there and nobody wants to splash around and swallow some of that and get sick. Let's find another way to isolate bacteria. How about membrane filtration? Here's a really neat process that's been developed, and it's not only used for purification of water, but it's also used um, for sterile uh, filtration of small amounts of water, and it's also used just to isolate bacteria from a liquid sample. You have, let's say, a lower count of cells, and you basically have them concentrated on the sterile filter a membrane filter. You see the pore size is small enough to retain the bacteria cells. The filter then is cultured and the colony count provides a cell count. As you can see there, here's where you're going to get the colony count. Okay? Remember that one cell can develop into a colony. Well, by the way, those filters have been used in a lot of other methods, including cleaning up the water to make it drinkable. That's how uh, sensitive and reliable those pores are. There's companies that do this all the time now. Also, you can look at biomass activity, and this can be assessed by turbidity, cloudiness of a bacterial suspension, liquid culture. The cloudiness blocks the liquid passage. Um, the turbidity can be measured by a spectrophotometer. The main point, and this goes back to what was referred to as Beer's Law. No, not that Beer's Law. The more you drink, the drunker you get. That's a joke, folks. It's a joke. But Beer's Law basically is saying that the amount of light going through a sample, you can measure out um, the, you know, comparing normal unblocked light with blocked light, and you can make a mathematical arrangement and say, this equals this amount of turbidity, and the turbidity can be measured out as being equal to the uh, amount of cultured cells. So it's sort of a mass number as opposed to individual count. Now, another way to do this is cell product detection. Cells will grow. They will make various substances, acids, gases, etc. Now, I'm showing you this here count, which is toward the end of the chapter. And it's more directed toward the most probable number method. I'm not going to hold you too much on... Um, the most probable number, but I will hold you on one particular important point, and that is the inverted small tube. The Durham tube, which you notice, is in some of the tubes. If you take a look at the upper row, there are a couple of tubes there that have a huge bubble, 
and they're somewhat elevated inside of that system. What they can tell you is that the, the bacteria produced a gas, it was trapped by that Durham tube, and that helps measure microbial gas production, and that can be used to tell you um, the type of bacteria, etc. Acid production, you can tell by how the microorganisms produce acids, with the concentration of such acids being correlated to the cell growth parameters via pH indicators. Okay. By the way, some of your tests for the understanding later on the isolation of certain uh, microbes. Basically, you grow the microbe on a culture, and you've got a pH indicator there. Um, some of them use um, phenol red, etc. And when it starts going acidic, it changes color, just like litmus paper. Okay? Gas production. In, if some bacteria metabolize sugars, they'll release gas, which can be trapped and measured, and that's what the Dunham tube is. That's where I'm going to focus you on that, all right? You don't need to go uh, further on that. You can see some information about turbidity here with the spectral photometer. Notice the two differences if you look on the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, you've got a tube on the left. It's proportional to the concentration of cells. It's cloudy. It's hard to see, hard to light to go through. The other one's fairly clear. And that's what happens. A concentration of cell suspension is going to be so turbid that it will not, it will block most of the light going through. A dilute solution would allow more light going through. And now you can set this up on a little chart and make assessments about the, the concentration of cells present. Okay, we're pretty much finished off on this chapter. Um, the one other one I just thought I'd give you is, this is a little interesting little diagram that shows up at the end. I believe it is on uh, one of the other pages. And what it really is showing you is this. Why do you got to, over a period of time, monitor your cells? Because your cell number might actually wiggle around there in that top purple line. But what does that mean? Well, the first cell line started to die, and as it was dying, a new cell line started to build up, eating off of the waste and materials, and they grew up to a certain point, got to a plateau, and they started dying, and so forth. The next cell line took over and created these problems. This is why fresh cultures and doing quick tests are always important. Okay? That's all you need there. Let's go to chapter five, control of microbial growth. Again, I encourage you, this is a big uh, situation when you do a uh, glimpse of history. I'm asking you to jump over to, to go over Ignat Semmelweis's work. I read a, a book on him, very incredible. He helped by just some of his observations and research and went up against a lot of people, but saved millions of women from dying at childbirth of septic infections. And it was all because of washing hands. Joseph Lister is listed on page 118. He also created some very important studies that we take very, very uh, cavalier today. We don't understand what it was. And some of this work was actually done not too far away, folks. Not too far away in, in, in medical schools. Okay. Let's get into, and also I encourage you to review the key terms. So what are we going to be talking about? Well, today we talk about control of microbial growth. There are methods to control them. They include physical methods, heat treatment, radiation, filtration, mechanical removal, that's washing. Physical methods, antimicrobial chemicals. Various methods depend on the, the degree of the control of required. The substance of the material to be treated, food, plastic, water, scalpel blade, cloth, open wound, ceramic, vinyl floor, and circumstances. Now, you notice the doctors or the personnel here. You notice that they're protected their mouth, their heads, their bodies. But this individual's got a further level of protection, the eyes. Don't kid yourself. We're going to talk about the term portal of entry. And portal of entry has been found at times to be even the eye. One individual was working on a patient with hep B, 
one little spliggot of, of small dot of blood splashed, hit the person in the eye, ended that person's career. In less than a year, they had hepatitis B and hepatitis B liver cancer and died a year later. So today, we talk about Ebola and you know you've got to have the mask, you got to have the gloves, you got to have the goggles, and you got to have uh, the boots, and you got to have the apron and stuff, and you can't allow stuff to leak through. But it also depends on what type of material you're handling, and what you're trying to prevent. And you see here an array of different situations for micro, uh, microbial control. I do need you to get familiarized with a bunch of terms before we go full blast into this. Sterilization, that's a process of removing or destroying all microorganisms and viruses. When we say something is sterile, it's free of viruses, bacteria, and endospores, but not prions. They're still working on that. Infection, this is the growth and multiplication of an organism or virus in or on the body of the host with or without the production of disease. Pathogen, Organism or virus causing a disease. Disinfection process to eliminate most or all pathogens, but some organisms may remain. Disinfectant, also known as biocides. Chemicals used to destroy pathogens on inanimate objects. This is important. Antiseptics. These are disinfectants for use on skin. Pasteurization, a brief heat treatment to reduce the number of spoilage organisms and pathogens in food. Decontaminated. The item has been treated to reduce the number of pathogens. Sanitize implies a substantially reduced microbial population that meets accepted health standards. Preservation, process of delaying spoilage of foods or other perishable products by adding growth inhibitors or making conditions for growth inhibiting. Nosocomial, this is referring to hospital-acquired infection. Bacteriocides kill bacteria. Bacteriostatic inhibit growth of bacteria. Fungicide kills fungi. Virucides inactivate viruses. The situational conditions you see there, for example, you have different situations. Whether you're talking about purification of water, control of cooking to prevent contamination, especially in large batches or at home, hospitals and healthcare facilities are very demanding. You don't want infections to be transferred. Uh, by the way, daily life, we have to do microbial removal, mechanical mi removal of microbes, dirt, organic matter, and some skin cells. We also have to consider cooking foods, cleaning surfaces, and refrigeration. Then we get into healthcare-associated infections, HAI. Now, this is, seems to have taken over from what was the older term, nosocomial infections. But whatever you talk about, HAIs are infections acquired while receiving treatment in a hospital or other health care facility. Okay? Just want you to get familiarized with the term. Some of the issues to consider. Patients may have weakened health conditions, weakened immunity, mod modified immunity. Okay? Um, Surgery opens the skin, leads to invasive exposure to pathogens. Patients with infectious Infections shed pathogens in feces, urine, respiratory droplets, etc. The challenge also for prions is they're very difficult to destroy or decontaminate exposed equipment. There's a study that went out a little while back, and sad, sad story. They improperly decontaminated uh, the stereotaxic surgical equipment for doing brain surgery. One patient was worked on, and they went through what they thought was a glutaraldehyde a disinfection, and he did this for 13 other patients, and all 14 patients, the first one had it already, a prion disease called Jakob Krudsfeld disease, which is uh, basically deterioration, it's a death sentence, and all 13 got the same disease. So one has to be very careful there. Oh, and by the way, if you look at that last case, what it looks like in the lower right-hand corner is they are preparing, uh, looks like, uh, some type of medical equipment, perhaps injectables. Can't tell from the image. But they're all in clean gowns and clean room attire. 
Now also, I want to bring to your attention that I gave you a handout this week, Breaking the Chain of Infection. I want you to keep that handy, as it will be referred to in the coming lectures, okay? So you really need to stay on top of some of the tools that I'm going to be popping in front of you. Microbiology labs, they require aseptic techniques, rigorous control of microorganisms and decontamination and disposal issues. Um, when you're finished with the cultures, you gotta, you got to destroy them. Uh, they can't just go floating around any place, and you don't want somebody to pick them up or come in contact with them. Food and food production facilities deal with food quality. To maintain food quality, microbes must be destroyed prior to food distribution and prevented from spoilage of foods. Water treatment facility, we deal with chlorine, ozone, other disinfectants that are necessary to destroy pathogens in water and prevent illness. Let's talk about antimicrobial procedures. Now, we got to deal with the organism first. The structure of the pathogen will play a key role in the method of pathogen control. Keep in mind the following. You've got to deal with bacterial endospores, which require extreme heat or prolonged chemical treatment to destroy them. Mycobacterium species, due to their waxy cell walls, are more resistant to chemical disinfectants. Pseudomonas, some are resistant to chemical disinfectants and actually live in some disinfectants. Yep. Naked virus such as a polio virus, lacks the lipid envelope and is more resistant to disinfectants. In other words, uh, because it doesn't have a lipid envelope, certain um, lipid solubilizing agents will not disable this particular virus. Envelope viruses are very heat sensitive and uh, to heat and chemical uh, disinfectants. Protozoal cysts and oocysts. These are dormant, resting protozoal cell having a thickened cell wall. Part of the life cycle of certain intestinal protozoal pathogens exist like this can be destroyed by boiling. Microbial deaths are affected by pH, temperature, presence of organic materials as these factors interfere with disinfectants efficiency. Get that point. Presence of organic materials as these factors will interfere with disinfectants efficiency. I want to bring this up to you again because you're going to hear this repeatedly. Example, chlorine. Uh, just pour chlorine bleach on it. It'll take care of it. Uh, you're going to need a lot more chlorine bleach. It's one thing to sit there and have certain uh, protozoans or um, bacterial endospores on a plain floor. It's another thing if it's with caked up mud, dirt, which is organic, which will sop up and neutralize some of the chlorine bleach. Okay? And it ain't nothing compared to if you walk into a surgery room, and I have, and the floor's got lots of blood and saline, etc. It takes a while to clean that all up. Let's talk about death phase. It takes longer to kill a large population of pathogens than a small one. The longer the exposure to the disinfectant, the greater the number of deaths in pathogens. Decimal reduction value, D value, is the time required for killing 90% of a population of bacteria. The technique used in the commercial food canning industry. Okay? Under specific conditions, each D value kills 90%. Therefore, two D values kill 99%. Three D values kill 99.99. Uh, well, that sounds impressive, but start going backwards with the numbers. If you kill 99% of 10,000, okay, but you still got some left, okay? If you kill 99% of a billion cells, I still wouldn't go near it. You'd have to go through so many more D values to bring the numbers down to a much more safe range. I used this chart for them in the earlier edition also. Okay, look at the D value. And then look at the log number. Now, by the way, to help you, if you're not, if you're not familiar with uh, logarithmic numbers, 10 to the first is really basically saying 10. 10 to the second is saying 10 times 10, which is 100. 10 to the fifth is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, which would be the basic way of saying, yeah, that's um, 100,000. Okay, 10 to the sixth is a million. In other words, one followed by one, two, three, four, five, six zeros. If you're going to start nailing these things to reduce 
the number of organisms you may have to go through very, very large periods of time to obtain the D values necessary to bring it from very high amounts of organisms to very low or no organisms. The measure of potential risk of infection. To guide the, the medical biosafety personnel in selecting germicidal procedures, a categorization exists defining the potential risk of transmitting infectious agents. Those with the greatest risks are subject to the greatest sterilization procedures. Okay? Now, what am I talking about? Well, take a look on page 123. You have to decide one of the following. Is it a critical item, semi-critical, non-critical? Critical comes in direct contact with body tissues. Semi-critical comes in contact with mucous membranes, but does not penetrate body tissues. Non-critical pose little risk as they come in, into contact with unbroken skin. So that's different when you're talking about having the risk chances of a hypodermic needle versus a um, Curlex bandage versus a Q-tip versus um, basically a cuff used for high blood pressure. Now, some treatments are inhibited or enhanced by temperature or pH. Also, some surfaces, sorry about the typo, are damaged or destroyed by pH, temperature, and select disinfectants. And what I mean by that is think about it this way. If you have a scalpel and it has a plastic handle, yeah, you can get up to the temperature to whether you use dry uh, sterilization or something else like that. But the temperature you get to disinfect and destroy that steel long time beforehand, you probably melted or if not burned off the entire plastic handle. That's just an example. Let's start talking about the treatments. Um, I do encourage you to go over to table 5.1 to review moist heat, dry heat, filtration, radiation, high pressure. Heat treatments. Now heat denatures proteins, but remember that to destroy spore proteins, a longer exposure time is required. Therefore, we get into autoclaving, which sterilizes products, pasteurization, which decreases microbe numbers. There's a difference. Here we have an autoclave. Here's part of the point. Keep this in mind. When you autoclave, you put water under pressure. Water under pressure will not turn from 100 degrees water to 100 degrees, and what I mean by degrees in this case is Celsius, of course to 100 degrees steam. Under pressure, you can get water as a liquid up to 120, etc. Celsius, and it's still a liquid. But that's going to put it, you have to have a greater amount of pressure there. Now, the higher the heat, the greater amount of denaturing of proteins of bacteria and viruses will occur. Keep, keep in mind that endospores are tough. So you're going to have to bring up the temperature and pressure much greater. That's where you get into uh, pressure cookers or autoclaves. Uh, if you've ever done any canning, you know that pressure cookers uh, for canners, um, you have to raise the temperature up above 200 to about 230 uh, Fahrenheit, or basically about one. 20, I think it is, Celsius, because the pressure and the heat has to be higher to denature and inactivate the endospores. And endospores uh, are very common for Clostridium botulinii on soils. So if you can in uh, green beans, you have to use a pressure cooker. Okay? Uh, flash autoclave achieves higher temperatures to achieve a shorter time course for the treatment, three minutes. These are all used for surgical instruments. And then we have the issue about indicators. Now, a lot of times what they use, you may have seen this if you've ever been in a hospital where they wrap the instruments, they put them through the autoclave, and they have either indicators using special tape. And if the tape has been sufficiently exposed to heat, you will get a removal or presence of certain striping, etc. Also, they will use biological indicators, which is the lower part there of the tubes. And what they'll be is certain um, 
organisms. Bacillus sterile thermophilus is one that comes to mind. And basically what you do is you run it in there, and if it's killed because it's received sufficient time, you know that your um, autoclave is still functioning properly. And they usually do this from time to time. I don't know. Some places may do it monthly. Others may do it quarterly. Others do it yearly. Canning process uses a commercial autoclave called a retort. And the canning treatment must kill Colostridium botulinum. Therefore, they go to a 12D value process. Let me see if I can bring this up to you to see. There we are. And what you see there are foods. They go through the processing. They wash to reduce the microorganisms. They blanch with hot water and steam. The cans are filled. They're heated. The air exhaust uh, from the can it's, that's driven out. And then the cans are sealed. And then they go through sterilization and cooling. And usually the period of that sterilization is done in such a way that basically you've got food that will last. And before you sit there and say, Dr. Oberge, how long? Let me help you. They did some studies. They went back. Um, Admiral Byrd had a single person base. I believe it was at South Pole. And a hundred years later, they found some of his canned items, and they pulled them out, and they brought them back for military study, because it was really important. The cans had not leaked. They had not bulged. They were still edible. It's not like I'd sit there and make lots of meals from them, but they were edible, contained most of their nutrients, uh, and they were intact. One hundred years later, folks, one hundred years later, Okay. Now, let's move on. Other means of basically uh, this treatment. Dry heat. Basically, heating in the absence of moisture. This is used for a lot of glassware, surgical blades, etc. Requires higher temperatures and a longer time course. This is if you've got materials that can withstand it, like Pyrex glass and stuff like that. It's very common I've seen in some labs that they'll use the autoclave to disinfect um, a lot of materials, but then they'll use a dry heat oven for other equipment that can stand a longer period of time and just dry heat. Okay? Now, what you see here is filtration. Again, I told you earlier about filtration uh, processes using membranes with special pores. The pathogens are removed from the solution. They actually do this in certain places. And um, basically, with a vacuum pump that pulls the uh, fluid, uh, because you have that drop in pressure in the lower flask, the filter will basically capture all of the bacteria, etc. And so you basically have the pathogens removed from the solution. Airflow filters also exist. You've heard of HEPA, which is high efficiency particulate air filters. But actually, that was a spin off from the submarine industry and in part also from the nuclear industry. And why it was going on is they wanted to be able to filter out particles. Um, from the air, so they would make rooms clear of pathogens or from radioactive particles from uh, basically bomb shelters. Okay? So we have these filters, and of course they're very common now. You can get them at Home Depot, etc., HEPTA filters for your furnaces and things like that. The next one is radiation. Now, electromagnetic radiation can destroy pathogens. Now, if you notice there, the bactericidal range really has an effect when we get up into the UV zone. Visible light, infrared, microwaves, they really don't do it. UV, X-ray, and gamma. Okay? Gamma radiation will form superoxide ions and the hydroxyl free radicals that will act on nucleic acids, cytoplasmic membranes, and proteins. Usually, gamma rays, x-rays are used for sterilization of things like surgical instruments and disposables, etc. Um, they're also used for some special foods. Uh, UV will be used for some materials that can't take 
the electron beam or the gamma ray tr treatment. Um, usually that has happened, if you remember years ago there was a boy that was born with a defective uh, immune system and what they would do is to get him books into his bubble chamber which had been completely sterilized so that he wouldn't be infected by anything and they would use a UV lamp on every page turn the page of the book, turn the page of the book, turn the page of the book and the book was completely UV exposed and they'd be able to send it into his bubble so he could read. Now endospores are resistant but high energy over time will destroy them. Also you have to understand that UV light will act on nucleic acids and it will cause thymine dimers. Okay so let's go back here. Chemical methods Oh, and by the way, I'll show you thymine dimers later on in the book. There is one there. If you wish to, you can look it up in the uh, uh, glossary at the end, and they'll show you a diagram of thymine dipers, dimers. Now, chemical methods. Really, the application depends on the level of disinfection that's required. You have to also keep in mind that chemical methods depend on are you doing this with a porous surface, a non-porous surface, a surface that's been exposed to um, uh, basically viruses or prions or fungi or bacteria, which you may not know at the time, or are you doing this on the surface of skin? Okay, and I'll show you this in a minute why. But they're different levels, you want to see the different levels, know the definitions, and the definitions of the low level, intermediate level, high level, and sterilants, I encourage you to know those definitions on 128. The key point is that intermediate and low level disinfectants are also called general purpose disinfectants. Translate, you can go down into your supermarket and get them. The higher level ones, nah, you might have to get a special supplier. In part, it's because of the toxicity. And Here's part of the entire thing. If you look down that entire table there, your selection of germicides depends on the following. Is it toxic to the human or to the environment? Is there activity and presence of organic matter? Hypochlorites are inactivated by organic matter. Dirt, feces, anything like that, that's going to just knock it out. Is it compatible with the material being tested? There's one thing to note that you have electrical equipment, or rubber, or metal, and will those be dissolved, damaged, distorted? The residue, must the resi is the residue that has to be washed off after use? The cost and availability. You have chlorine dioxide, it has a limited shelf life. Also, can the substance be concentrated? The environmental risk, can I flush it down the drain? I'll give you a pointer or two. I used to work in hospitals and they would do a lot of ethylene oxide gas, and what has happened is, that was considered somewhat carcinogenic, but they also considered it um, a greenhouse gas, so they were beginning to order hospitals to phase out of it, or at least phase out some of the applications of it. The classes of germicidal chemicals, and you'll see this on figure 5.7 and table 5.2, I included this diagram here, which was an older one, but it was much, much more important to see where this was happening. If we were talking about bacteria, was it working on the cytoplasmic membrane, the proteins, or the DNA? Going through these, alcohols act on proteins. They can be used on the skin and they're more effective as an aqueous solution. Aldehydes act on proteins and nucleic acids, therefore they're capable of inactivating bacteria and viruses. Biguanines act on the cytoplasmic membranes, hence chlorohexidine. Ethylene oxide acts on nucleic acids, but it's gaseous. Halogens act on proteins. Chlorine will kill endospores. Low concentrations are used for water treatment, purification, and swimming. Chlorine dioxide is a gas. If you remember when they had the Amera anthrax uh, threat, one of the things they pumped into the Senate buildings, the House buildings, that were contaminated with anthrax spores was chlorine dioxide. Iodide does not kill endospores. Pseudomonas can survive in it. Metal compounds, they act on proteins, so silver, mercury, tin, copper. 
Many of those are being phased out because of the environmental concerns. Ozone will act on proteins. Peroxygens act on proteins. Hydrogen peroxide acts on proteins. Will not damage metal, glass, rubber. There's no residue. And of course, if you had a cut or scrape, you've used hydrogen peroxide to do a disinfection there. Parasitic acid acts on proteins, but it's more potent than hydrogen peroxide. Phenolic compounds, phenol, acts on cytoplasmic membranes and proteins. Take some time to go over Joseph Lister on page 118 for the glimpse of history. Triclosan is in soaps and toothpaste. Hexachlorophene acts on Staphylococcus. Now, quaternary ammonium uh, compounds, quants, are antipathic molecules that act on cytoplasmic membranes. They do not work on endospores, mycobacterium, or naked viruses. And unfortunately, pseudomonas are resistant. Now, you can see where they would act. So sometimes you might have to have a mixture of several different compounds to effectively be assured that you have n neutralized everything. And if you read the instructions, some of them are very clear. The material has to be present. It's not spray and wipe. It's spray, wait 10 minutes, then wipe. Okay? Let me, uh, and of course, here's one of the famous ones, cl uh, Clorox. Okay? Now, by the way, how do they do some of this testing? Now, this is something you'll probably see later on. This is what is referred to as a Kirby Bauer discs. So they have a culture, and over all of the blue is a, uh, basically what you would call a lawn of bacteria. And then they would treat each one of these paper discs with different compounds. In this case, for disinfectants, I'll just tell you this. They would have a control disc untreated. They would have the different discs treated with different compounds. And this zone of exclusion, and we'll talk more about this in a couple of more classes, this is the area where this particular chemical on this particular disc was able to kill off bacteria up to this distance. The greater the zone of exclusion, the greater the impact on the bacteria. And of course, as you're passing along here, by diffusion, you're going to have a greater concentration close to the disc and a lesser concentration farther away from the disc. So this gives you an indirect means of determining, hey, this is a lot more powerful than, let's say, B here. Because E, even as it gets less and less concentration, still has a means to inhibit the growth of the bacteria. Whereas B, you have to be pretty close to very strongly concentrated for it to even make a small dent in this bacteria. OK? Now. Before I go into food preservation, keep in mind some of the places that you see. If you've ever worked in the surgery hospital area, I have. Some of the places that you have to face the decontamination. Not merely on floors, not merely on just the patient table, but on surfaces, on cloth, on metal, flooring, etc. And don't mention just, you know, you've got to treat whatever handles, whatever works, wheels, in between the wheels, etc. So maintaining disinfection in a hospital setting, and that's in Perspective 5.1. I encourage you to review it and think about it. When we talk about food preservation, the methods are directed to inhibit or slow microbial growth. Methods must be non-toxic and minimize food alteration. In other words, nobody wants funky tasting ice cream. Nobody wants uh, poor coloration of their chocolate bars. Okay? Nobody wants strange colors on their vegetables if they bought them canned. So there's a big science in food microbiology, but not just from the microbiologist view of how can I make this taste better. It's how can I preserve this so that it gets from point A to point B and the consumer wants to still use it and enjoy it? One of the ways, of course, is low temperatures. And if you ever get to read the biography of uh, Charles Birdseye, who developed flash freezing, it's fascinating. But low temperatures, and we're talking about in the refrigerator range of 35 to 40, slower stop critical enzymatic reactions 
in spoilage organisms. Now, some psychotropic uh, uh, and psychrophilic organisms may still survive. Freezing temperatures, minus 1 to 5 degrees Fahrenheit in the freezer, stop microbial growth. You unfortunately can still form ice crystals from cytoplasmic water, and that will kill cells. Now, I say that unfortunately because what you're talking about is the equivalent in some cases of damaging cells for the food product, but also damaging cells, which is a good thing, of the microbes, and thereby keeping them from growing. Chemical preservatives. Weak organic acids. You might read on your labels, and everybody goes bananas over things, but benzoic, sorbic, propionic acid, a lot of these are naturally found also. Some of them are found in foods like cranberries and, and other products, and they've just been adapted and used in a lot of other foods to lower the pH to prevent growth. Nitrates inhibit germination of endospores and the growth of Clostridium botulinum. Nitrates, a lot of nitrates have been used, sodium nitrates, etc., in processed meats. And you need, I wanted to bring that up to uh, your awareness. Well, later on, I'm going to do a little more on food microbiology later on. Reducing the water. Okay, this is the AW, the quantitative measure of water available. Reducing water activity below the limits of microorganisms, the pathogen growth is inhibited. This is absolutely important. And how does it occur? Well, hypertonic preservation using high sugar or high salt in food. High sugar. You make jams and jellies. They're loaded with lots of sugar. High salt. Brine. Brine is very salty. The hypertonicity, that's the high solute concentration of the sugar or salt, causes plasmolysis of microbial cells. Now, some organisms can withstand high salt concentrations, especially from bacteria in saline environments. So here's the key kicker. How did the sea-faring uh, population that got these fish keep them from going bad? Simple. They pickled them. They added vinegar, which dropped the pH level. The organisms couldn't handle the pickling as well as the salt. The low pH and the salt preserved the fish and stopped uh, the spoilage of the food by bacteria. Two other ones that are critical. Drying of food, desiccation, sometimes helped by adding salt or chemical preservatives. Freeze-drying uh, uh, freeze is one, but also dehydration. There's a big move for those who want to store their harvests, and they dehydrate. And dehydration is very, very simple. And in some cases, it's, it's very preferable because basically, once you reduce that food, by removing a lot of the water, whether you use a freeze-drying process or a regular dehydration process, you retain most of the nutrients, etc. Now, freeze-drying differs from just dehydration. Dehydration, you pass a warm air over it. The water, uh, because you've cut the food into small enough pieces, the water comes right off of the uh, food, dehydrates, no rotting occurring, no, no decay. Freeze-drying, what you do is you drop the food quickly to a very, very low temperature, you freeze it. Then you put it under a vacuum. You have a process where literally you, you have what's called sublimation. The uh, water in a vacuum, frozen, will immediately turn from ice to gaseous water. It will not go into a liquid state. And so what happens is it just vaporizes off and you have a dehydrated food which has all the nutrients. And if you think I'm kidding about it, there's big industries, you look into it, uh, where they do food preservation all the time that way. Well, that pretty much covers us. We are now come to just about the end of our lecture here for Chapter 5. I encourage you to review the microassessments and the chapter summary, and then we'll be going into Lecture 3 soon. And until then, have yourself a, a wonderful day.